Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujiwana and today we're looking at the requirements that go into many fictional designs. These are the reasons behind what makes them the way they are, which is a complicated topic for a fictional craft because these reasons come in two very different categories. The out of universe requirements are the ones that actually define something's design, while the in universe ones are often created after the fact. We'll talk more about the out of universe stuff later, because examining the potential in universe reasons is where the interesting story and world building stuff can be found. And we start with external limits limitations, like the size and mass limits placed on spacecraft, since there's only so much room inside the payload fairing of rockets. This leads to things like deployable equipment, like antennas and solar panels that unfold or even unroll, and modular space stations made from many parts that can individually fit into a launch vehicle. A related requirement is compatibility with existing stuff, like train tracks or ammunition, which can lead to strange situations where measurements are used long after the original reason for them has become irrelevant. Another related concern is geographical requirements, which yeah, this is less of an issue in space, but it's important for ground vehicles like tanks. Japan, for example, has a lot of bridges, so it's important that their tanks be light enough to use them. This then ties into logistical requirements, since if you can't get your equipment where it needs to be, then it's useless. Like having the maximum width of ships for the Panama Canal, or a space gate. There's also potentially an opportunity cost to be considered. Do you ship fewer heavy tanks, or more medium tanks? Part of this decision is what doctrine your nation is using, that is, what broad type of warfare are you committing to, and how does your equipment fit into that? Star Wars has its Tarkin Doctrine, a strategy of using fear through overt displays of overwhelming power to keep control over the galaxy. This means huge, powerful ships like Star Destroyers, and ultimately, the Death Star. A different requirement is the legal one. A nation may be limited in the number of types and craft they can build like the Dreadnoughts in Mass Effect, based on the real-life Washington Naval Treaty which limited the number of capital ships the signatories could have. This led to things like a proliferation of cruiser designs that were just under the limit, and the odd carrier built from incomplete hulls meant for other types of ship. This use of pre-existing components, weapons, or even entire hulls is yet another potential requirement to be considered. Obviously, not every single thing on a new design needs to be brand new, so this is a good way to save on costs, but it also helps logistically, though chasing cheapness has its downsides. Another cost-saving measure is to repurpose old equipment by updating key systems on the same chassis or hull. This could also be as a stopgap measure until a more well-rounded design is finished, like with what happened a few times with Cold War tank development. A requirement in a similar vein could be that a new gun, vehicle, or whatever is designed alongside other similar things to have commonality with them all. The idea behind this is to hopefully simplify training, maintenance, and logistics with all the shared elements. There's a cool example of this sort of thing in Gundam with the United Maintenance Plan, where Xeon standardised many of the parts for its mobile suits across their production lines. Hands and cockpits were the most important parts, allowing cross-compatibility of pilot skills and handheld weapons. It's a neat detail and of course it's something that Gundam has. The more I look into the setting, the more I find out how well thought out everything is, even if this was an idea that was thought up after the fact. Another very important consideration is one that has an effect on all the other requirements, and it's whether you build the thing yourself, or do you import it. The latter means you don't need to have the industrial chain or expertise needed to fully design and build something, but then you end up relying on someone else for spare parts and the like. But if that's not a huge concern, this can really save a lot of money since the development cost is likely shouldered by someone else. There is a halfway option where you pay someone else to make what you want, but if you do build something yourself then of course you have full control over the project. And doing this also lets you build, or keep, all the experience, knowledge and industrial base for the future, which is exactly what the French armour industry did in World War II after the liberation of Paris, with the ARL-44. It was behind the times and not many were built, but it kept those weapons engineers employed. 
We're going to stick with tanks as we talk about the potential for peculiar designs to arise from the intersection between requirements and technology, like the famous STRV-103. This turretless MBT was a unique vehicle that came out of the need for something that was low profile and well protected. The technological progress comes in since stabilizers weren't yet good enough to be truly used on the move, so the Swedish doorstop lacking one didn't matter too much. Another interesting side effect of some requirements is that things can end up being built for, but not with, a particular system. This means there's all the things ready to accept something built into the ship, but the something itself just isn't there yet. Like with Halo's Strident class frigate, many of which are lacking the shield generators the ships are meant to have due to delays. That's just a neat little detail and adds a lot to the background of that ship. But while it's a cool idea in fiction, in reality this can cause big problems, especially when a vehicle is designed around that system. This is sort of what happened with the Zomwalt class and its advanced gun system, since there was never enough ammo made to actually use them, leaving the ships with no purpose. At least now they're being refit for hypersonic missiles, I guess? Now, as I said in the intro, there's also out-of-universe considerations that are generally a much bigger concern in the world of fiction. The requirements for the story, visuals, vibes, and practicality come way ahead of any world buildy lore stuff in the vast majority of cases. Star Destroyers are big and scary and resemble naval vessels for the feelings all these elements create. The lore bits came later. Another triangular example is the excellent Valkyrie shuttle in Avatar. According to Ryan Church in an interview with The Space Shipper, this was designed to meet script requirements for the big climactic battle of the movie. It needed to have engines that could be destroyed by a grenade, and flat space on top for defences and action to take place on. Avatar is a good place to talk about realism, because how realistic you want a design to be is yet another requirement. It can be a deep look into making something based on real tech, or just including things like radiators because they're awesome to look at. But realism depends on if it fits with the rest of the setting, and more broadly, if the story being told actually benefits from the addition of it. There's also often a need to design stuff to fit into the pre-existing style rules of a setting. Battlestar Galactica Deadlock did a really great job of this, creating many colonial and Cylon craft that built on and expanded on the style of both the 2004 series and even the original. Stars Trek and Wars are both stuffed with great examples of this due to the age of the franchises. Trek has great kit bashes and a whole swath of in-universe eras with their own styles, but I want to highlight the amazing work the Star Trek Online artists have put in over the years, matching all these eras and even creating their own that made it to canon. Star Wars does neat stuff with the evolving lineages of designs, and at times has done some really cool stuff like the factory new Y-Wings. So if all this world building stuff isn't as important, why bother with it? Well, the specifics may not be needed or given to the audience, but the requirements do inform the vibe of whatever the thing is. Take the Rebellion in Star Wars for example. They don't really have any industrial base at all and use whatever they can get, starting out with what few ships they were surreptitiously given or what they could steal. In contrast, the Empire had seemingly endless industrial capacity and focused it on making huge things to terrorise the galaxy. Even going back to the original movie and comparing the two sides, you get that same feeling. The Rebels have a mix of different, scuffed up craft and are fighting the cleaner, more uniform forces of the Empire. The audience can infer a lot from just that. But if you do want to go deeper on the world building, then including little touches from the messy way that real life things are procured, designed and built goes a long way. You can support Space Talk by joining our Patreon, where you can get our Frigate and Space Fighter design reference books. Alternatively, you can support us directly through YouTube by becoming a channel member. Thanks to our supporters, and thank you for watching.